Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center this hour. The run to new highs and why a growing number of market watchers say it's time to change your strategy in stocks. We're going to debate the next move for your money with our investment committee today. Joining me for the hour, Joe Terranova, Steve Weiss, Shannon Sakosha is the chief investment officer at Boston Private Wealth. Michael Farr is CEO of Farr Miller in Washington and a CNBC contributor. And Tiffany McGee is with us today, the CEO of Momentum Advisors Institutional Investment Services Group. Let's go look at where stocks are currently trading. S&P going for its longest winning streak since April. There you go. Uh, S&P and Dow are positive. Dow's the big outperformer today. S&P, though, about 1.5% away from new highs. Joe Terranova, I begin with you. The question is, how are we going to get to those new highs? Value is outperforming today. Is this the start of the long-awaited rotation? Well, you're initiating a great conversation, Scott, because as you uh, have identified, the S&P 500 is basically sitting less than 1% above its all-time high. What's critical, though, in getting there, if you're not going to have a significant outperformance from what has worked, which is clearly hyper-growth, is you're going to have to have the participation from the value names. And let's put in context where value really is. Scott, the Russell 2000 is still sitting 9% below its all-time high it achieved in August of 2018. When I'm thinking about value, I also have to think about value and get contribution from small cap value, not just large cap value, because there's been such a differentiation in the small cap index this year. Small cap growth is up 22% year to date. Small cap value is down 12%. So yes, I believe it has to come the contribution from small cap value. You have to be very tactical in how you're doing it. You have to ask yourself, where am I taking the money from if I'm allocating it to tactical value? But I also want the technical support. And there are some names that I've gotten into recently where you're seeing technical support. You're seeing some 52-week highs. But I just don't want people going out and looking at these value names that could be value traps and saying, oh, from a price standpoint, they're cheap. Let's right. just buy them. That is a very dangerous strategy. All right, Shannon. So, I mean, this, I think this is the biggest question in the market right now. Are we going to see this great rotation from growth into value? And, in fact, uh, you know, is this the start of it today in what has really been a trade? Values outperform growth in terms of the ETFs. Um, markedly over the last month, the value ETFs up 5%, momentum's only up a, a quarter of a percent. Jonathan Krinsky today, a well known technician, to uh, Joe's point, talking about the technicals as well. Krinsky says, well, this trade has continued to struggle uh, since the massive run up. We think it's setting up once again. Is he right? Well, we've had a lot of fits and starts on this trade over the course of the last year, Scott, and we've talked a lot about that. And I think, you know, there's two parts to this argument. Is this rotation to value sustainable? And if it is, what does it need to create? What, what does the economy need to do to create support for it to be sustainable? And I think that's even more important. In order to have a true rotation to value and a rotation to cyclicals, which is really how we look at it, we need to have evidence that the economic recovery is sustainable. So otherwise, it's, it, it, you, know, you will not continue to see value stocks outperform. They need a cyclical tailwind to couple with the monetary and fiscal tailwind that we've been enjoying. And so otherwise, what you're going to see here is you're going to see perhaps a pullback in mega cap tech, for instance, that offers a buying opportunity for people that are looking at a low growth low interest rate environment ahead of us. Unless you expect there to be growth and inflation, which the yield curve would start to indicate by steepening, we're not going to see a sustained rotation to value. And so we're looking for that economic credibility to create our basis for a sustained rotation to value. All right, Steve Weiss, Tom Lee told us on Friday this big rotation is going to happen this week. Maybe this is the start of that. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson says the better relative opportunity at this point is with cyclical stocks. Those stocks most levered to the recovery over the next 12 months. We would look to add more exposure to that side of the barbell if the market corrects as we expect. We talked about this a lot, Steve, you know, whether this rotation was going to was going to come, whether these tech stocks have have simply run too far and you need a catch up trade. And maybe this is the beginning of something. Well, I don't look at the overall market as cheap, but here's what I'd suggest. Rather than listen to strategists or, or technicians, listen to vaccine researchers. Because if you get a vaccine, you're going to see those laggards lift with, as Joe points out, regard to valuation. So price is not valuation. 
So I would tell you that a lot of these are already expensive. But if a vaccine happens, everything moves up. Does anybody really believe that the technology stocks, which have also been held back, I would say, in terms of the fundamentals and their earnings by COVID and the economic malaise, with the exception of the Zooms and so forth, does anybody really think they won't benefit in an economic recovery? No, they like will. Like we saw they over will. the last but, nine but, years? But what happens, of course what, they will. But they will. You're, 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 you're right. Your, your point's well taken. But isn't there potential for more upside on the ones that have lagged? The, the cyclical, the value, the epicenter, the reopen, whatever you want to characterize that trade as? A absolutely. As a trade, I agree. As an investment, if you look at a number of years, I don't think things will change in the half of the last 10 years or so. Value will be a laggard. Now, there are some that will definitely have huge moves. Those will be the airlines, the cruise ships. But then you've got to go back and say, okay, how much have I been diluted? How much has my balance sheet been hampered by this? So, yes, yeah, so I think it's a good move. It's the obvious move now. It's the move in front of the vaccine. And there's, you know, I've increased my weighting in those stocks with the Johnson Controls, with a Trinet, with an XPO that I increased, with a UPS. So I have put that bell, you know, that, that, that barbell approach in. And then what really hurt the technology trade is the China relations which continue to hurt it. And so that's, that, those two things have combined, conspired more aptly to push value ahead. Tiff, Dow's up almost 300 um, today. Is this the start of something bigger? Uh, so I, I think everybody makes really good points. You know, I'm, first of all, I'm not uh, ready to, um, you know, uh, throw tech over, over the boat or growth. Um, so, you know, we really uh, continue to focus on identifying like other pockets of opportunity. And so, you know, I've talked about the fact that I favor, uh, you know, investment banks over commercial banks. And um, in particular, as we're having this conversation about value, um, you know, I really like their, uh, their diversified revenue streams, but I really like within the, in the financial segment, um, outside of JP Morgan and, and your Goldman Sachs, if you will, kind of like the usual suspects, I really like the independent investment advisors. Um, and so they've actually, uh, they actually tend to and have been outperforming the broader financial sector. Um, the prices are really great. Uh, as a matter of fact, they outperformed about 14% in the second quarter. Um, they beat, they're beating revenue expectations, uh, and they really do have this diversified uh, stream of revenue um, that is counter cyclical. So I really do like those plays, and I'll give you maybe just three ideas. Uh, PJT Partners, Great Price, uh, Evercore, uh, and um, uh, Houlihan Loki. Yeah, we're looking at those value plays. I mean, the, the, the banks have been, I don't know, a lot of the financials have been value traps, right, because they haven't gone anywhere. Michael Farr. Why don't you address sort of where we are, where you, where you see us going? And if we're going to make new highs, is it the value stocks that are going to get us there and beyond? Scott, I think we've been talking for a long time about having a sort of an upgrade in quality in portfolios. And a lot of the value names are good places to start. But all the value stocks aren't the same. And a lot of them can be value traps. A lot of them are cheap for reasons and are probably going to stay cheap for a long time. But those that are exposed to uh, at the economic recovery as we come back from pandemic, I think, have a really good opportunity for investors and probably a decent time to diversify out of some of those that have been just tremendous winners and probably become an overly large part of a lot of people's portfolios in those FANG stocks. With the dollar falling, a lot of those multinational companies are going to benefit from that currency translation at quarter end. They're going to benefit from the weaker dollar. A lot of the multinationals are going to do that with fabulous balance sheets. They could sort of qualify as value stocks. I think that there are some very good names there to begin to migrate, but not too quickly. You know, a lot of people have called the end of this dance prematurely for months, and maybe even years. Also a resurgence into value for the wait. We've been waiting for 10 years for value to come along. I think don't look to the sector, but look to the theme of that undervalued that have gotten beaten up here that are going to see a recovery uh, and are also going to have a tailwind, I think, from currency. Maybe this is finally the moment, Joe. I mean, you just literally bought Deer. You bought Mosaic. You're adding to CNX and EQT. You must think that this is the start yes. of something if you're, if you're willing to buy those stocks. Well, Scott Yes, Scott. I, I have tried to not be fully exposed to mega cap growth. I have tried to find 
opportunity as it relates to value and doing it in a capacity that I kind of replace the word value with quality. I focus on debt to equity. I focus on return of equity. I focus on what's the sales uh, growth rate over the last three years. The names that you mentioned, CNX, EQT, I've been adding to those positions. I've been talking to Stephen Weiss about them. EQT is at a 52-week high, but there's other names in my portfolio that can be treated as value that I think are qualitative. I think you could look at a Best Buy. I see the opportunities in the industrial space. I see the opportunities in the energy space. Well, what about Deere and Mosaic? Talk to improved. me about those specifically, right? You're talking around a bunch of things. Deere so, and Mosaic, why? So Deere and Mosaic, it is, as I was beginning to say, it's about a better performance in business activity as it relates to industrials, as it relates to energy. And the same case can be made for Mosaic. I know Pete Nigerian owns it. I know Tom Lee spoke about it on the network last week. They are also concurrent with a technical breakout. You look at Mosaic, it cleanly broke out above its 200-day moving average last week. So I like that formation. Um, talking about cyclicals, which clearly have some form of a catalyst here to value, Scott, the cyclical trade has been outside of the U.S. So I believe now the opportunity is to return some of that global cyclical uh, capital that's been allocated, return it into domestic cyclicals. I think that's the right trade. I would exclude financials, though, from this conversation because, and I agree with a lot of the names that Tiffany has mentioned, but I just don't know in terms of the support you're going to get from the yield curve if financials are going to see the same type of recovery that you'll get with the return of business activity as it relates to industrials and, and energy. Weiss, I, I go back to Kramer's goal list, right? We, we've debated this the other day, but I go back to it today because these are the kinds of stocks that would likely work if you think that value stocks are going to have their day. Finally, the Disney's, the PVH's, the Emerson's, MasterCard, Nike, PPG, DuPont, Ralph Lauren, 3M, Union Pacific, Nucor. Now, you may not love every one of those, but the theme is consistent to the kind of conversation that we're having right now. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, those stocks will move. They've been laggards. They've been oppressed. PVH, great management, great company. Uh, you know, I had to go to the mall to pick something up this weekend. It's a ghost town. It's sad to walk in there. It's depressing. So you really need a vaccine to see those, those stores come back, those stories come back. But I'm going with quality. And I'm not necessarily going with sectors. I just view some of those as lower quality stock holdings. Um, and they're a better place. We talked Lulu, which Pete Nigerian and I own, versus a Ralph Lauren. Ralph Lauren's been a problem over the last few years. Right, but, but here's uh, part of I the like point, Joe's right? Picks. Here's part of the point, yep. Steve. A everybody knows mm -hmm. about Lulu, right? Lulu's up 50% year to date right. for obvious reasons. The part of the point right. here is to try and go beneath the surface and find that next wave of stocks that are maybe in the, in the retail area, for example, that are going to be able to have a good go of it if you think value stocks are going to rise because you think the economy is going to be able to pick up some steam, that there is another side to this. You talked about the vaccine. Good vaccine news is likely good for a lot of different retailers. Why isn't Ralph, for example, part of that conversation? Because Ralph is going to be a trade. Ralph will move up in a trade. They don't have the fundamentals, haven't had them for a long time to be a sustainable mover. So what you're really talking about is being a psychologist and saying, okay, what stocks are people going to go to? And the junk, and Ralph's not junk, but it's lower quality than I would say than other companies like a Target, which I own. So to me, the strong gets stronger when the debt clears, and the weak will have their day in the sun, but it'll be a short-term trade. I want to be longer term than that. So I bought a Johnson Controls. I mean, that is, they had a great quarter, but what do they do? They're in office real estate, but they're also in HVAC. They're in making the air and buildings cleaner. They're in security. So you need a lot more of that to bring people in. But is it a place where you want to be commercial real estate right now? No, but the stock's moving because management's performing. They're early to cut costs. Trinet also. Trinet actually had a phenomenal quarter. Trinet is selling at a discount to market multiple. They're going to be just doing great business. They're the outsource solution for HR, including insurance, uh, compliance, uh, payroll. They're going to do quite well when the market comes back because they're doing well now. They're basically flat year over year. So do you want to be in something like that where companies are going out of business? They're in the small and medium business segment. 
No, but it's a strong company that will get stronger. So why dip down the quality line to get Q to play a trade when I can buy something that's going to work now and going to work in the future as well? Shan, in terms of the go list, Union Pacific, I mean, I know Disney is owned by a lot of people. We've had many Disney conversations. I don't want to do that now. But Union Pacific is on this list, and it happens to be in your, in your book. Right, and I actually, I don't disagree with what um, Steve just said. I just want to be clear. I think you can still maintain quality in your portfolio, but take advantage of the fact that some sectors have just been under pressure. And so if you look at Union Pacific, if you look at Martin Marietta, um, there are tailwinds for these companies that indicate that there are high quality, well-run companies that you can look at from a fundamental perspective in your portfolio and, ha and be able to sleep at night but might also benefit from this value rotation tailwind. And so, you know, if I look at Union Pacific or Martin Marietta, similar story for me. Um, I see, you know, in, enhanced economic activity, potential infrastructure spend, a move from, you know, from the coast to the heartland. You see the move to, uh, from a population perspective into Texas. And so I don't think that you need to, you know, hold your nose and pick lower quality stocks in these sectors. There's high quality companies in these sectors that are going to benefit from this rotation. So you don't have to necessarily bottom feed here. And we've always been adamant about that over the last six or nine months. Tiff, MasterCard's on the list. You own it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, it's, we're not buying any more MasterCard right now. Again, um, within financials, uh, you know, we really do like those independent uh, investment advisory uh, companies and really, we really feel like that's where the value is right now. Yeah. Well, let's add another voice to the conversation that value is going to have its day. Dubrovko Lakos is the chief U.S. equity strategist at J.P. Morgan, joins us on the phone once again. Dubrovko, welcome back. Hope you're well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everybody's coming out of the woodwork now. It's, it's Krinsky from the technical side. It's Tom Lee from the fundamental side. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. And now you. We see an increasingly compelling case for value with a, de with a greater degree of sustainability than in prior months. Why is that? So we've had we've had already uh, a few. I, would, I want to say this is the fourth attempt that value is making at a comeback since since the you know end of March uh, lows, uh, market lows, uh, and the first three attempts have pretty much gotten reversed. And I think the main reason for that has been just simply, let's say it, uh, lingering uh, COVID fears. But I do think that you're now basically seeing an increasing number of signals that are coming together and suggesting um, that COVID recovery theme. Uh, has or should have more legs. And as a result, you know, value broadly speaking, yes, but more specifically, you know, some people call them the, you know, the, the epicenter stocks, but more specifically, these call it laggards or COVID, um, you know, impacted stocks uh, that have a relatively good balance sheet, pretty decent fundamentals, I think could be sort of the next leaders of the market over the course of the next, uh, you know, six to 12 months. Uh, and so I'm not talking here about the big new sort of structural investment. I think that a lot of these secular growth, long duration names, I think remain very well supported. But I think that right now, sort of the next six to 12 months, I think we need to be thinking more about some of these laggards that have pretty, pretty, good, uh, pretty good balance sheets and, and, and could see much higher degree of uh, upside earning surprise than the growth names, which I think at this point have pretty much most of the goodies priced in. Uh, and, and I think l l less room to surprise on the upside. You think that... And, the and I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I forgive me. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no. I was just going to say, and then clearly, you you know, you could definitely make a sort of a flow and a positioning argument in terms of you know extreme positioning and sort of people are hiding in a lot of these long duration uh, secular growth names, uh, short interest levels for a lot of these COVID recovery stocks. They actually have pretty good fundamentals. Uh, do remain elevated. So I think you could see a little bit of a uh, of a rotation there for sure. The difficult part is really timing this. It's very hard to time this by the day, by the week. But I think this is what people need to be thinking about in the coming period. I mean, there's been so much roadkill of those who are talking about value, as you mentioned. This is the fourth attempt. Do you, do you feel like the, um, the virus news is, is taking a turn for the better? And, and that's going to be some of the fuel behind this trade? I, I still see so much unevenness regarding the virus and where, it, where the outbreaks are and, and what the better side of this is going to be. So, I mean, a few, few things that I would like to mention really quickly. So, one, yes, the global COVID recovery, we think, continues to make progress and fears around the latest surge that we even had in the U.S., I think should be abating, while there is continued advancement on the vaccine development 
uh, side with a very strong pipeline in place. We'll probably get more results in September and so forth. Uh, two Q earnings, I think, are pretty much marking an inflection point in the profit cycle. Uh, I think for a lot of these laggards and value names, the worst pretty much is over. Um, thirdly, I would say global business cycles across all the regions are definitely showing a pretty healthy upturn. Another thing I'll mention, which is really interesting, and I think people are not giving it enough attention, everybody's talking about how rates need to move up for value to work, uh, but I'm not sure that rates uh, are the best signal right now. I think if you look at inflation expectations, inflation break-evens, I think they're a better signal because of all the central bank intervention that's happening, keeping, keeping rate structure lower. Inflation expectations are moving sustainably higher. And historically, this has been a very strong positive for value. But, so I think that's an interesting signal to look at as well. I mean, if, as long as you have 20 plus million people unemployed, don't you put a cap on, on what those kinds of stocks can, can do? The discretionary names and some of these cyclical names, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depress the output of the economy if you have 20 plus million people who are still un unemployed. And the jobs number on Friday, while a step in the right direction and while a touch better than expectations, still suggests that, that hiring is slowing. Yes, I mean, it is. Look, it, it, it is. And look, we, we need to see how exactly how quickly this recovery will play out. There's still a lot of people without jobs. But I think here the question that people are asking is really not so much what will the sort of the, 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 the next few months look like, but really what will 2021 look like on, 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 the, on the labor, on the job side. And I do think that we should continue to see, uh, you know, uh, improvement. And so I think that bodes very well for a lot of these laggards. When you look at the gap between sort of call it your main COVID beneficiary names that are pretty much outperforming the market anywhere from 25 to 35 percent on average versus the laggards that are basically behind the market by 25 to 30 percent. You're looking at a 60, 70 percent gap between these two. And, and again, I think a lot of it is really what will earnings revisions trends look like for these two categories, not, not end of this year, but really next year. And I think next year we should continue to see a much healthier economy and an actual you know, even even stronger recovery as far as the job market goes that should support these lag. Yeah. Guys, I mean, you know, Shannon, you say uh, as as Tobias Lefkovich is talking about today over, over at City, what is going to force people out of, of tech and into some of these value areas? Well, he says it's not going to be valuation. There could be a number of different things. But Shannon isn't part of the issue. You, you have to give people uh, or force people to make a move out of technology into some of these other areas. And that, that may be a hard sell, if you will. It's, it's certainly not going to be negative news because mega cap tech has been the, the best defensive trade over the last six months. And so I do think that, Scott, you make some great points. I mean, we're coming on this really important inflection point over the next six to eight weeks. A lot of the economic we've improved, improvement that we've seen just can't continue at the rate that we've seen over the last eight weeks. And therefore, at what point does, you know, do investors look at that economic prognostication and say, yeah, I'm really sure that 2021 is going to be significantly better. And so for us, that's why, you know, we have trouble thinking this is going to be a sustained, a sustained binary rotation to value. You need to have that economic backdrop and you need to feel that there are going to be continued improvements in hiring, in consumer activity, in consumer confidence, all of which have, which have weakened over the last two to three weeks. So I think this is a bit early, um, but, you know, there, there still are opportunities in these undervalued uh, in these undervalued sectors. Dubrovko, um, energy, chemicals, machinery, airlines, durables, restaurants, leisure, financials. You really like all those groups? I mean, I mean uh, it's, it's very hard to generalize, and I think some, some, some of the folks on, uh, you know, on the set made a few comments earlier. I think it's hard to generalize value because you do have, you know, a number of very sort of stressed, uh, you know, companies w w within the value uh, camp for, for, for very valid reasons. So I think you sort of need to look at, you know, theme by theme, in the sub industry by sub industry, stock by stock. But like what I said is, yes, broadly speaking, value cyclicals is where I would be tilting, but more specifically, the COVID recovery themes, which does incorporate names from the consumer side, from the industrial side, from some of the materials uh, and energy as well as financials. So, yeah, broadly speaking, those groups, but obviously you want to focus on, you know, um, you know, better businesses and, you know, better run businesses and, and, and you know, and, and, and better balance. Bravko, appreciate your time as always. Thank you for being with us again. Thanks for having me. That's Dubravko Lakos, uh, J.P. Morgan's head of U.S. equity strategy. Part of the issue, uh, as I see it, Michael Farr, is if you do have money coming out of, of tech, 
because it's such a big part of the S&P, the overall market is likely to have an issue unless all of that money comes out of tech and goes right back into these other areas to prop the market up. Wall Street Journal today looks at the issue of market concentration, something we've been speaking about almost daily for the last many, many weeks. Together, the 10 biggest firms uh, in the S&P 500 comprise 29% of the index. Okay, that's according to data that they've looked at. Michael, if you have money coming out of the, let's just say, the biggest 10 stocks in the S&P, and the great majority of those 10 are tech, which they are, can the market handle that? I think the death of tech has been uh, sort of forecast for the past few years, and it's always been a bit premature, I guess, as Mark Twain would have, would have said. You know, uh, that concentration that has driven the S&P, driven uh, certainly, and driven the Russell 1000, has been in place for at least the four or five uh, of, of the last years, where it's been that narrow concentration that has driven the leadership and the performance. To say that that's going to end, I think, is probably uh, is, a, is a very risky call. So uh, I think the, the, the thing that makes sense is to sort of pare back and trim. And no, I don't think that a pare back and trimming trade will affect those in any kind of a serious way, because they're, they're still the leadership, Scott. I think they're going to continue to lead. To pare back is one thing. I can't see the markets abandoning uh, in any way th that leadership and those darlings that have, have made everybody so much money. No, I get so, you. Um, I, I, I don't see it coming, yeah. yeah. Nor, nor do many of the analysts, uh, Michael. Apple target raised today, street high, 515. Apple target raised, 480. Deutsche Bank, Pinterest upgraded, yeah. uh, overweight. Morgan Stanley goes to 44. Your point's well taken. Wall Street analysts are certainly silly. not willing to get off yeah. the train. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, no. NVIDIA shares surging nearly 90% this year. One firm now thinks that run's going to continue in a big way. We're going to debate the bullish call coming up, the rest of the semis as well. We'll do that straight ahead on the half. All right, welcome back. Let's get to Contessa Brewer. She has a market flash for us on the casino stocks. Hey, Contessa. Hi there, Scott. Yeah, session highs for Wynn and Las Vegas Sand on news that tourist visas will be issued to Macau from neighboring Guangdong province and then expanded eventually to the rest of China. Melco is also up big on the day as well. MGM, which has properties, nor normally gets about a quarter of its revenue in Macau. The big news for MGM today, and look at those numbers for its stock, is the billion dollar 12% stake that Barry Diller's IAC took. Paul Salem, MGM's chairman, told me today sports betting will be massive. They have run more online commerce business, that's IAC, than we've ever have. In fact, they may have forgotten more about e-commerce than what we know. Who could you pick that would help your company the most? Paul Salem told me. He said, I would have picked Barry Diller. I want to mention as well that DraftKings and Penn are apparently under pressure today. DraftKings down more than 8% perhaps more competition from MGM and IAC, but also news that COVID might interrupt college football season as well, Scott. Yeah, I bet. I mean, Penn is directly related. What do you think? Is it the, the Barstool uh, deal that they have, and that's why I, that would be reacting the way it is? Yeah, exactly. And they've pinned all their hopes on this big, massive venture with Barstool and sports betting. And so, again, another major player that helps MGM. And MGM was already well-positioned to compete, so bringing IAC on to help compete in that online space is going to add pressure to these other companies. Right, I appreciate that, Contessa. Thank you. That's Contessa Brewer with an update there. Shannon, you own Las Vegas Sands. Yeah, the, certainly the Macau news is, is welcome to, uh, to shareholders of Las Vegas Sands. You know, this is a pseudo-China play for us. Um, but I think that the point about an expansion of investment in online gaming is also important. This is a part of the economy that continues to grow, particularly in that younger male demographic that uh, businesses are looking to capture. So uh, even though Penn's under pressure today, uh, I think we're going to continue to see some strength and a tailwind for gaming stocks across the board. But we're very happy to see that Macau news for uh, yeah. LBS. Big, big day in casinos, as you just saw, real sizable gains uh, across that whole spectrum. Let's get to Frank Holland now. He has the other headlines for us this hour. Frank. Hey, good afternoon, Scott. Here's your CNBC News update. Chicago officials say more than 400 police officers were called in to control looting. More than 100 people were arrested with at least a dozen officers hurt in the downtown area. Mass transit was stopped and bridges raised to restrict access. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says the city is now coming after the perpetrators. These individuals engaged in what can only be described as brazen and extensive criminal looting and destruction. And to be clear, 
This had nothing to do with legitimate protected First Amendment um, expression. And in the Amazon, wildfire fires are raging and raising some concerns about the destruction of the rainforest. Brazil's space agency recorded more than 5,800 fires in the first six days of August. That's 7% more than just last year. If this pace keeps up, it will be Brazil's worst August in nine years for fires in the Amazon. That's our CNBC News update for this hour. Scott, back over to you. All right, Frank, appreciate that. Frank Holland, NVIDIA got a new price target today, and it's a street high. Rahel Solomon is with us today with those details. Hey, Rahel, good to see you again. Hi, Scott, always good to see you. So Bank of America, yes, raising its price target to a street high to $520 and reiterating a buy rating on NVIDIA. So while analysts do expect a slower quarter for the company's cloud growth, they point to NVIDIA's huge market share in gaming chips versus rivals like AMD. They really expect strong performance there to offset any cloud weakness, noting that the strong gaming environment right now, plus the launch of both Sony and Microsoft's new consoles later this year, that's going to be huge. We also saw new data from the NPD group, which noted another record quarter for U.S. spending on video games at more than $11 billion. So that's being driven on the hardware side with new console sales, along with more spending in-game and through subscriptions, which companies like Activision and Take-Two have noted in their earnings calls. Scott, you and I have talked about that on this very show. NVIDIA, by the way, up almost 90% year-to-date. Yeah, which Tiffany knows well because she's the only one today who owns it. Tiff? Yes, yeah, so uh, we've been in uh, NVIDIA for, for, for quite some time, uh, about six years. Uh, so we bought it around 200. Uh, it did take a, a really uh, small dip this morning, but I think it's at now at about uh, 4 or 35. So we continue to like the story. Um, and we're uh, absolutely behind it. Yeah. Rahel, one of the issues, obviously, is, is NVIDIA has so broadly outperformed you know, most of the other chips and certainly the index as a whole this year. Certainly, and broadly is a, is a good way to put it. So compare NVIDIA up about 89% year to date to its competitors. AMD is up 76%, Qualcomm up 20%, Broadcom up 3%, Intel down 18%. And when you compare it to the ETF, SMH, it's up 20%. So, yes, certainly uh, dominating the, the chip space. Yeah, for sure. Rahel, thank you. Uh, Weiss, Taiwan Semi, um, you mentioned it many times. I've given you props many times already. Uh, I guess I have to give them to you again. Uh, Tiffany owns Taiwan Semi uh, as well. Uh, actually, yeah, no. We you don't. Know, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That, that was my fault. Weiss, you go sorry. first. Yeah, yeah I'm I didn't want to give you, I didn't want to give you a chance to gloat too much. That's why. That's why then I moved on to, to Tiffany. But I, I guess I, I, I owe it to you because I don't think that you've been on talking about it recently since I gave you all those props. So you can take your victory lap right here. Well, I, I appreciate it. And, and this is a heads up. And it's, a, it's, it's an historic moment. But here's some self-deprecating humor. I'm beginning to regret selling my NVIDIA at 88. <laughs> uh, so it took me a few years to have that regret. Look, Taiwan Semi is a great company. Taiwanese base, but huge operations in China. Um, and they're involved with Apple. They're basically, you know, the outsource play. And as I continue to say, you're going to see the biggest launch of any Apple product with a 5G phone. But technology overall has continued to do well. So Taiwan Semi is about 30% or 35% since I bought it. I think it continues to go. I think it's very cheap stock here. All right. Good stuff. We'll take another break. Gold prices are rallying this year, as you know. We're going to tackle that trade through ETFs straight ahead. But first, let's give you a check of the S&P sectors before we go to break. See what's going on today within the S&P, which is up a little less than two points. Energy and industrials materials, value, value, value. The cyclical trade is working today. It's outperforming. You can, a reminder for you as well, you can watch or listen to us live on the go on the CNBC app anytime. We're back after this. We're back at Bob Pisani has our ETF edge today. Hey, Bob. Hello there, Scotty. Uh, gold prices are pulling back a bit from their record highs today as the dollar strengthens, but the year's bull run for gold is undeniable. It's up more than 30%. Gold ETFs are following stoop. How much more is there left for gold at this point? Let's talk about it with Tom Leiden, CEO of ETF Trends. Jan Van Eck is the president and CEO of Van Eck. He runs the Van Eck Vectors Gold Miners ETF, GDX, up 52% so far this year. Jan, let me start with you. You did a paper last week arguing that gold could go from $1,900 to $3,000. You mentioned gold as a deflation hedge. Why have you become so bullish on gold so suddenly? Well, uh, basically it became really bullish uh, last summer when gold broke out of its uh, six-year uh, sort of sideways market. 
And then the other technical confirmation happened when it went to all-time highs a, a month or so ago. It went to the $1,800 an ounce and then the 1921 level. So we've got the fundamental support, very low interest rates from the Fed, historically low rates. And if you look at prior cycles, we're not trying to make it up. We just said, look at prior cycles. And that, in, in a low inflation environment, gets you to $3,400 an ounce, actually. You know, uh, Tom, the problem I've got with the gold bugs is they try to argue it both ways. I mean, we, they used to argue gold was a hedge against inflation. And now there's arguments being made that gold is a hedge against deflation as well. Can you actually make both of those arguments? I mean, or it seems like hedge you win, tails you win with, with gold on those kinds of arguments. Well, you're right, Bob. However, uh, in this environment, the moon and the stars seem to be aligning really well for gold. When you talk about potential inflation, we're starting to see it at the grocery store. Part of that is uh, uh, the the connection between getting food in, into the stock market, I mean, in, into the markets. The other thing is, which is really key and critical, you're seeing a lot of real estate start to go up in value outside in suburb areas as people are moving out of the city. Those things are really key and critical as people are anticipating inflation. One key thing about gold that we yeah. don't spend enough time on is supply and demand, where emerging market countries are really buying gold to a great extent, and there really isn't that much gold in the ground, and it's taking more and more money to get gold out of the ground. Hence, do you buy the metal itself, or do you buy the miner? And we could spend a lot of time talking about that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice all of this. I just want to know the GLD, the largest gold ETF, now the sixth largest ETF in the United States, $83 billion in assets under management. We're going to talk a lot about this. We're just getting started here on ETF Edge. Catch our live online show at 1 p.m. Eastern time, etfedge.cnbc.com. We'll be joined by Ben Carlson of Ritholtz Wealth Management to talk what could be a record year for the ETF business, believe it or not. And, of course, we'll get deeper into gold and whether you should be holding gold or gold mining ETFs. Don't miss all of that. Scott, back to you. All right, Bob. Appreciate that. Well, your, answer, uh, your questions are answered straight ahead. Uh, to reach our experts, go to cnbc.com slash halftime or tweet us. We're back in just 30 seconds. Answer some of your questions now. Joe, you get the first one today from Charles in Maryland. Marriott's up quite a bit. Speaking of Maryland, Maryland-based company. Uh, what's your outlook? So, Scott, I purchased this on June 29th. Uh, I've got about a 13% gain. I'm holding this stock. I believe it moves much higher, and it's going to be on multiple expansion. It trades about 16 times versus a 10-year average of 21 and a half. You're seeing a strong recovery in the luxury brand and specifically outside the U.S. Occupancy rates for China, they measure at 60%. One year ago, they were at 70%. So this is an example of a quality type value name that I think you should be long. All right, Steve Weiss, Tommy in Texas. Anyone buying the builders? He's looking to buy Pulte Group. What do you think? You know, my biggest position when you combine it all are the uh, two home builder indexes, which are the X XHB and the ITB. You have two things going on that have never happened before, which is a mass exodus from the cities into the suburbs, and interest rates being as lo historically low for mortgages. So you can buy Pulte. You can also buy the indices. You can buy any of them. It's a great investment. The X XHB broke out to an all-time high. I think it keeps going. All right, Chan. Jim Ulanowski wants to know about IBM. When's it going to show us something? Well, the earnings report wasn't all that bad. I think it was a lot better than folks expected. Listen, this is, is this the best tech company that you could ever buy? Probably not. But it has an undemanding valuation. It has a 5% dividend yield. And it has a catalyst to turn around. It's not going to take business entirely away from um, AWS and Azure. But it certainly is going to be competitive. And they have this intangible base of competitive knowledge that they can utilize for larger enterprises. So um, I think if you buy this stock here, uh, you're going to get some appreciation in it and while you wait you're going to get a nice dividend yield. Michael Farr, Sam in Florida wants to know about Ross Stores, R-O-S-T. Sam, I own it. I have a small position in it. It's one of my riskier positions. I think that management has done a very good job through this pandemic. Stores were closed. They cut back. They cut back. And uh, I think they made very good decisions. This is the low-end consumer, of course, uh, turning over uh, inventory and new inventory all the time. I think it's going to make it. I think it's going to come through fine. They've done a lot of the right things. So, uh, yes, 
but uh, this is not a blue chip. All right. Tiffany, for you, uh, Ken, South Carolina, is there still upside with Ulta? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ken, I'm not sure where you buy your makeup, but for me, there are only two real options. One is Sephora owned by LVMH and the other is Ulta. Um, but Ulta is a slightly different um, uh, uh, market share. They tend to carry the more affordable products. I also like that they have salons inside of some of their stores. So the stock is down about 16% year to date. And so I think it really presents a good buying opportunity. All right, Joe, I have a question for you because I noticed you sold IEMG and you've been talking up the emerging markets. Why'd you sell this? Yeah, I, uh, IEMG, Scott, that's the emerging market equity. I kept my emerging market debt. Um, I said before, if you're going to be allocating towards domestic cyclicals and some of the value plays, where does the money come from? Um, I took some of that money from selling IEMG. I also sold Domino's Pizza. So those are two areas uh, that I sold out of. I think the emerging market equity story in the near term might be slightly challenged. Longer term, though, I'm not going to change. I think there's been a paradigm shift where it's investable once again. You sold Domino's, too. Yes, I did. And that again, that is part of, uh, took a little bit out of what has been a growth story. Um, my choices really were Best Buy, Nike, um, or Domino's as it relates to consumer-oriented businesses. I wanted to stay with Nike. I wanted to stay with Best Buy. Unfortunately, I had to sell Domino's to raise some capital. Uh, to purchase some other things doesn't mean Domino's isn't a quality company. Still don't like the pizza. All right, coming up, the dollar's been rebounding recently. What that means for oil prices down the road, we're back in just two minutes. We're back. Let's do the futures outlook now. The dollar is fighting to kick off the week in the green after getting hammered this year. You know about that. Growing uncertainty around the U.S. economic recovery, certainly one of the culprits there. Our next trader, though, says the bottom may be in. Let's bring in Scott Nations of Nations Indexes. Really? You think that? Why do you think that? The, the dollar is recovering as the global economy recovers. And, Scott, what's the evidence of that? Well, we see crude oil up 2 percent today. Uh, copper's up nearly 3%. Iron ore is down today a little bit, but it's down for the first time in nine days. Gains in factory orders in Europe are, are another point that we can look at. And if the world is recovering, then U.S. rates have likely bottomed. And if U.S. rates have likely bottomed, then the dollar has likely bottomed. And Scott, you'll remember we got long the dollar index on Thursday, worked out really well for us on Friday. I want to do that again because it has a long way to go. So in the dollar index futures, I'd be a buyer of this September contract, as you can see there, 93.25, so a little bit of a pullback. Stop to the downside would be 92.90 because we're always going to trade these with a stop. Target to the upside would be 94.25. And, Scott, at those prices, we're risking $350 to make $1,000, but the dollar's got a long way to go to the upside if rates have indeed bottomed here. You think the gold trade's topped? I, if, if the dollar is going to get stronger, then gold is going to have a real tough headwind. And I, gold has, has made all sorts of sense because rates are low, the dollar's gotten creamed, yeah. but it's come a long way, and so you have to wonder if it's not topped out over the short term. Well, I'm thinking of uh, everything happens, as you said, it's going to happen for the dollar. That would mean it would be potentially negative for gold. Scotty, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. i got to run. That's Scott Nations with us. We'll do final trades next. Welcome back. We'll do final trades in just a minute. Weiss, though, what do you think about what Scott Nations and I were talking about? Do you think this is potentially the week where you see the dollar bottom, gold top, and then value take off? I, I do think you see the dollar bottom because everybody's so focused on it. Uh, and I think gold has just been, you know, that stage right trade that everybody's gone into. So, yeah, so in terms of value, look, I think value still has some legs because people will be so afraid of, of missing it. So I agree with all, all the things that Scott said. I mean, he's thinking about it the right way. Yeah. By the way, transports are, are soaring today. Kramer's talking a lot about that. I know we've, we've talked about a number of the stocks within that over the last many weeks. Tiffany, let's do final trades. You're up first. What do you got for me? PayPal. So they recently reported strong earnings, and uh, their share of the e-commerce marketplace has accelerated since the pandemic. They're also investing in in-store contactless payments, which represents a larger opportunity for growth. It's up 83 uh, 0.63% for the year. All right, good stuff. Good having you back today with us as well. Michael Farr, final trade. Medtronic. Medtronic's got uh, a terrific pipeline. Uh, they're a 10% uh, grower, and uh, you're going to have more of these elective procedures coming back. Also, 50% international, sticking with our theme today, Medtronic. All right, Shan, you're up. 
Estee Lauder, a uh, fast growing prestige beauty category, a global business, and so able to monetize the recovery in the global consumer. Joey T. LSTR, Landstar Systems, Intermodal Transportation, Logistics, and an Increased Commerce Activity All right. Environment. All right. Weiss, quickly, please. Skyworks. It's not been a lagger, but it's about right. to break out again. All right, good stuff. Good seeing everybody. Thanks for watching. Bill Griffith, it's over to you in the exchange. Scott Wapner, thank you so much.